Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to an episode about the Apostle Paul, a deep dive where Trolls Ingberg Peterson is going to tell us about Paul and identity. Does his theology and philosophy, and in some ways, can we better understand what the Apostle Paul's writing, to whom, why, what's he saying, what, what is his philosophy, what does he say when he talks about the pneuma, the spirit? And is it immaterial or is it some form of a material? There's so many things we unravel in this episode. We discuss Paula Fredrickson's view, particularly on Paul, and uh, things he agrees with and maybe disagrees with. So you're going to want to stay tuned. You'll have a better grasp of Paul by the end of this episode. Don't forget to check out my Patreon to help support Myth Vision, early access this video, and many others. We are <laughs> Myth Vision. Welcome back okay. to Myth Vision Podcast. I have a special guest today, and I hope I pronounce your name. It's Dr. Trolls at Ingberg Peterson, correct? Excellent. Wonderful. Yes, it couldn't be better. <laughs> I'm surprised because I always butcher my pronunciation of things. So um, do you mind me calling you Dr. Peterson, or what do you prefer? Trolls is fine. Trolls. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I will try my best to stick to that because uh, I was raised by a mom and dad who said, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Well, and, and <laughs> I'm Danish, and we are a little bit different on that point. So, <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you, Trolls, for joining me today on Myth Vision Podcast. Let me give everybody a little background. There's so much to say here, but uh, Trolls is classics. He's at Copenhagen from 1967 to 74 on ancient philosophy at Oxford in 1974 to 76. Results, among other things, Aristotle's theory, theory of Moral Insight, 1983. The Stoic Theory, and I'm going to butcher this. Is it Oikiosis? Oik well, very well. Yes, 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 that's good. Oikiosis, but, but never mind. Oikiosis. There's a pronunciation yeah. in the Greek that um, <laughs> That was in 1990, and the New Testament, Copenhagen, 1986, from 2000, as a professor, results... Uh, Paul in his Hellenistic context, 1994. I, I feel like I should actually be showing the books for the sake of it while we're doing this because everybody needs to go get a copy. And the one we're mm -hmm. going to talk about is Paul on identity. But who knows right. where the conversation will go because I want to cover all your works, to be honest, at some oh. point. <laughs> so That's Paul, a lot. Paul on the Stoics, Paul beyond Judaism, Hellenism divide. Uh, in 2001, Cosmology and Self in the Apostle Paul, the Material Spirit. That sounds like an interesting thing. Everyone thinks the spirit is immaterial. We need, to talk <laughs> we need to talk about that. That was in 2010. Also more recently on the Gospel of John, John and Philosophy, a new reading of the fourth gospel in 2017. I'm so curious. Right now, uh, you work on Paul and philosophy, selected essays, and this is for 2023 to appear in a prestigious German series. And here yeah. belongs two research semesters at Yale, 1987 and 2001. This meant close to acquaintance and collaboration with Abraham Malherb. Am I saying that correct? Mal Mal Malherbe. Malherbe. Yeah. Wayne Meeks, Richard Hayes, I know of them. Del Martin, I know of him. Eventually, Harry Attridge, of course, I've interviewed right. Dr. Harold Attridge, and many more. Since 1987, about 30 annual meetings of the Society of Biblical Literature, <laughs> and here, the Hellenistic Moral Philosophy in the New Testament group and the Pauline Theology group, both 1980s to 1990s. Did I miss anything, Trolls, or mess up on anything here? Absolutely not. Um, uh, you, you are quite right. I I, I did mention to you myself uh, these uh, stays at Yale uh, and also the uh, fact that I have gone to um, all these SBL annual meetings. And that is because it has been tremendously important to my work uh, to have this uh, contact with extremely uh, wonderful scholars in the United States. Uh, you see, when I, when I started out as a sort of philosopher, uh, as you mentioned, it was uh, Oxford, uh, and Oxford was at that time a, a highly um, flourishing uh, university for uh, both philosophy in general and also ancient philosophy. Uh, but then when I turned into the New Testament, I 
was looking around to find out where is the most important work being, uh, uh, being done in the New Testament. And, and I came to Yale and that was uh, tremendously um, helpful and fruitful for my own work. And I, I keep, I have contact with people, uh, Yaleans as it were, uh, um, still uh, right now. So, so that's important to me to uh, stress that. Also, uh, during my work, I have had a lot of contact with people in uh, the Nordic countries working in the New Testament. I've learned enormously from them, uh, and also gradually uh, in Germany. Uh, so, but, but there is a sort of pattern here, first England, uh, then the United States, all through the Nordic countries, and then gradually also uh, Germany. I really enjoyed uh, in your book in particular, because you're you have a lot to offer myth vision here. We're an mm -hmm. educational platform. We try to take uh, how do I put this in? This is not disrespectful to scholarship. This is actually respectful to scholarship. But mm -hmm. scholarship kind of, in my opinion, is almost hiding underneath the lampstand. And, and like yeah. Yeah. the general public has no clue. They feel like. They have to, you know, pay for a university to go and learn. And I get it. It's sure. expensive. Sure. We try to take that stuff that average folks think are boring or, mm -hmm. oh, that's that you got to be brilliant to understand and and chew it up and spit it out for the general public to get a mm -hmm. little taste mm -hmm. and go, wow, <laughs> this is actually mm -hmm. Very important and interesting material, especially if you want to know what the New Testament authors are saying or Old Testament or Hebrew right. Bible, being respectful of Jews. Um, but you in your book, there's a scholar you mentioned, William Reed. I was writing an article about this particular, the secret Messiah complex mm -hmm. that's going on in Mark. And you said this mm -hmm. is one of your one of your favorite scholars in history was learning from uh, William Reed in 19. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh well, he died in 1910, as I recall. Uh, but, um, well, uh, first of all, he was a scholar who was not at all afraid of tearing down what everybody else had uh, been saying if it, could, if it couldn't stand up. And he did that boldly and uh, uh, with, with, without, you know, um, looking uh, left or, or right or anything. And, and secondly, he also had this uh, impulse to... Uh, write in such a way that it was intelligible, intelligible to uh, everybody. Uh, in fact, I think I mentioned in in that poll on identity that uh, that he uh, wrote a sort of Volksbuch. Uh, about Paul, and that mean, <laughs> means uh, a book that was intended for the whole people, uh, which is a wonderful idea. Uh, it is also a very good book, but so many things have happened in Pauline studies that one couldn't just, you know, translate it and then say, this is what we know about Paul. Uh, so I had that very much in mind. Whether I have succeeded is a different matter, but <laughs> that at least was, that was, at least was the idea. Well, if I could take a second just to let everybody know, please go get a copy of his works. In fact, I'm enjoying this book so much. You're going through the authentic letters of Paul, of course, uh, trying to get a better grasp of what Paul it means. And I was reading, not only do you talk but, to... But mind you, Derek, uh, the one I can see here is John on Philosophy, which of course is a wonderful book too, but we are talking about Paul on Identity. Yeah, okay. Right, right. And in your book, I was going to say Del Martin, right? That I've actually had a phone conversation one night with Dr. Martin, and mm -hmm. um, he he takes an approach, as we're diving into this, I, I just want to mention, he takes this approach where he says, you know, people don't, you know, People don't care, most people don't care why Mozart wrote his first uh, symphony. And in fact, mm -hmm. you mentioned this in your book about symphonies uh, mm -hmm. and Mozart. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, this is interesting that you're bringing this up because I had a phone call with Del Martin and he said, people are more concerned with how they interpret the first symphony of Mozart and how it means to them. And, mm -hmm. and while I get that, and you try to take this balance in your introduction to this book of how does Paul matter to us, however... Mm -hmm. I have to be honest, my goal, even though it may be an unachievable goal, is to try and understand the zeitgeist, the matrix in which Paul lived, his audience, what the problems they dealt with. What was Paul, what did Paul mean? What was he mm -hmm. saying mm -hmm. and why was he saying it? And mm -hmm. Dell Dell said, well, you're you're asking to walk on water because in Dell's <laughs> mind, he's acting like it's not possible. You just mm -hmm. don't even try. He tried to tell mm -hmm. me, don't even try. You're wasting your time. And I'm 
I feel like I'm not wasting my time. I want to, <laughs> I want to know what Paul meant in your book, your book about this on Paul and identity is a must get. So please go get the book, ladies and gentlemen, and also support us on Patreon. This episode will air on Patreon first for those who support us here to help us continue educating the world. I have tons of uh, videos with John Dominic Crossan, Christopher D. Stanley. I've done some with Del C. Allison Jr., um, uh, James Tabor. The list goes on and on. There are academics I'm even trying to get a hold of. Uh, uh, Dr. Paula Fredrickson, who I am hoping to get on Myth Vision sometime this year, and uh, that will be there for those who help support us. Enough about my introduction. I just, I, I want to know what Paul means. And so I have to pass this off to you on your research agenda. If you don't mind telling us what your agenda is. Okay. Uh, this will be a little bit, well, first of all, I want to thank you for um, expressing your, um, what is it, interest in uh, trying to get to understand what Paul himself meant in his uh, own context, because that is also part of what I'm very much uh, after. Uh, and when you say that uh, Dale Martin says that that is impossible, Dale is a very good friend of mine, and we've been talking about these things uh, over and over again. Uh, we disagree on that. Uh, he has a rather fancy view that that's impossible. I, I, I don't agree. I see all the obstacles, and uh, that is up to us to be clear on them. But uh, I certainly think that there's something approaching um, the historical facts uh, is, is possible to, to reach. Uh, so uh, when we now s discuss a little bit about my uh, research ag agenda, one thing that I have been very concerned to uh, show and help people uh, come to see is that the so-called uh, divide between Judaism and Hellenism doesn't work. Uh, you mentioned rightly a book I edited in 2001 called Paul Beyond the Judaism-Hellenism uh, Divide. Uh, and um, th that was precisely a collection of, of, of uh, articles with, among other, a contribution by uh, Del Martin. Uh, and, and the aim of it was to show that this uh, automatic reaction we have that something is uh, Jewish and something else is uh, Hellenistic or Greek or Roman, or etc. This automatic reaction should be questioned. There may be uh, certain elements in it, but um, we, we cannot just start out from there. We have to uh, look very carefully at each particular topic, etc., and find the roots, etc., and also be aware uh, that there may be absolutely no divide of that kind in the minds of, say, uh, in this case, uh, Paul himself. Uh, or perhaps it would be better to say that, but this is something we will come back to, I suppose, that Paul was and remained a Jew, but that did not exclude that he also um, was aware of um, what we consider to be specifically Hellenistic or Greek or Roman, namely philosophy, and that he might make use of that. Uh, these two things do not go uh, together, go against one another in, in the way we are accustomed to thinking. And, and that, I think that is a very important point to keep in mind. It, it may sound as if everybody now agreed on that, uh, but in fact, when you look at what people are saying, you can see that it is at the back of our minds and, and in, a, in an unfruitful way. So that has been the first topic, as it were, on my uh, research agenda. If I may, on that particular, sure. those two topics, um, I've been reading with uh, M. David Litwa, who's written um, mm -hmm. how the Gospels became history and stuff. And yep. and in his books, not just that, the uh, Jesus Deus and other great works that I've enjoyed, mm -hmm. he points out that that whole divide of like, oh, there's mm -hmm. Hellenism and then there's Judaism. And it's like, mm -hmm. uh, no. Mm -hmm. And many academics such as yourself have been writing about this and saying, mm -hmm. I, you know, you think you're looking at something and you think that's the opposite. No, even in the mm -hmm. most sectarian groups of Judaism that we would Precisely. call were yeah. Hellenized. And so you're yeah. looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls. These people were Hellenistic mm -hmm. thinkers in some mm -hmm. respects. And we mm -hmm. would call them the most conservative, maybe. Absolutely. Absolutely. Also on the other coin, I've had academics who want to push back on Paul knowing philosophy and stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. And 
they they say, well, maybe he has an idea because it's in the air, but but uh, he's not really into it. And mm-hmm. I did a recent interview with uh, Christopher D. Stanley, who's a Pauline uh, mm-hmm. scholar, and mm-hmm. he said that when Paul uses terms like Jew and Greek, mm-hmm. he he uses Greek. He's not like Jew and Gentile or you know uh, mm-hmm. the nations. He mm-hmm. did, he uses Greek specifically, mm-hmm. and his, his he says, and maybe we can get into this at some point during your interview, that. He's Paul is in both worlds, kind of kind of like what Philo of Alexandria is. He's mm-hmm. both Greek mm-hmm. and Jewish, and mm-hmm. he's tearing down both mm-hmm. ideas. The Jews mm-hmm. think that they have what it takes, mm-hmm. and they think they got mm-hmm. it all. Well, the Greeks think the same thing. They, they have a high pedigree. They think there's something. So he uses this term mm-hmm. for both categories to say, mm-hmm. no, your philosophy, it, you know, it's foolishness to you, and Jews want signs. It's foolishness to you. He has this new Christ program, uh, this Jesus program, if you will, that that he thinks is going to somehow fix it. I don't know where this is going to go, but I'm interested in your agenda. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, this is something one might really uh, discuss in in some detail. It has to do with First Corinthians chapter one and and two. Um, I, may I just say in direct response to what to what you've been saying that um, one reason why he uses Greek there I think is that he is talking about um, well the, as you said the Jews uh, go for something and then the Greeks go for something else named is Sophia and that is um, one word that they use for what we would call philosophy or the kind of insight you get from philosophy. And it may very well be that he uh, felt that that was particularly, um, well, uh, part of what it meant to be uh, a Greek, that you had this kind of uh, cultural heritage. Um, but that actually leads me to uh, my sec- the second point in, 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 on my research agenda, which is to try to convince uh, everybody that Paul was also a philosophical thinker. Uh, even though he was a Jew and he remained a Jew, etc., uh, precisely due to this uh, intermix of uh, Hellenism or Greek thought and uh, uh, Judaism, uh, we have also to uh, accept that he operated in a manner that we would call uh, philosophical. In places, not everywhere, uh, he has also certain ideas about the Messiah, etc., etc., that uh, do not belong to uh, philosophy. But in Many places, and it has often to do with uh, when he is trying to explain things about the law, the Mosaic law, he does become philosophical, I would say. Uh, uh, and I could explain to you what that, what that means, what, what defines philosophy here. But the main point uh, is really that, uh, that he is in places working as a philosopher. He did not see himself as a philosopher, far from it. He was the apostle of Christ, etc., etc. But he works in such a way that when we look at the context, etc., we will have to say, yes, okay, he is working like a philosopher. I would say I'm, I'm not a philosopher, but I'm fairly <laughs> confident if you Who listen is? to me, you'll probably go, he knows some philosophy, and <laughs> I have read some. I'm just not a philosopher per se. Right. Um, now, in particular, y- you were going to get into like the specific profile. I'm mm-hmm. interested in, in hearing. Let's dive in. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, uh, there are a, a number of uh, elements in that, and um, – one, in fact, uh, has to do with what we were talking about, situating Paul uh, within a Jewish and Hellenistic uh, context, etc. Um, my specific profile in that respect is that I'm not really so interested in whether we should say that Paul was um, Jewish or Paul was uh, Jewish and Hellenistic or something like that, as it as as if we were to. Um, draw up the results of uh, scholarly investigation, and then we know that, and we are happy, and we can turn somewhere else, and and never mind about that. What I'm more interested in is to try to use 
um, the material that we get get hold of when we are doing that uh, kind of comparative work, comparing Paul with other Jewish uh, thinkers like Philo of Alexandria, whom you mentioned a moment ago, or comparing him with uh, philosophers, uh, Greek or, or Roman even uh, philosophers. I'm, I'm more interested in what can we get out of that to understand Paul better? That, that is my, my main aim, really, uh, because I have the foolish or not so foolish idea that uh, once you understand Paul in his historical context uh, uh, better than we perhaps did before, then you have also learned something that you may uh, eventually use in this or the other way, either by rejecting it uh, or by accepting uh, parts of it. We can come to that later. But, but the point is uh, that I want to understand Paul better. Uh, so it's, it's not, if it doesn't work uh, to bring in uh, philosophy for comparison, then I just skip philosophy in a way. Uh, but I do think that it uh, that, that it works, and that is the uh, that is the reason why I I, I, I keep bringing in ideas from Hellenistic uh, Roman Greek Roman uh, philosophy to see whether it helps elucidate uh, specific arguments and Paul's in this or the other place. This is exactly my goal. In fact, this is. This is what I would say you're, you're saying to our good friend, Martin, Del Martin, like, hey, I want to figure this out. I, I, mm -hmm. I understand that you would sure. say, hey, um, the, the New Testament is art and it's it's reinterpreted through every generation. I get mm -hmm. it. And and I, I have fun looking through church history and watching how the church fathers reinterpret mm -hmm. the book of revelation mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. through history different people thought the beast is this and that mm -hmm. and this mm -hmm. this pope mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you name mm -hmm. it this president mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. that's fun but mm -hmm. that doesn't get to the answer for me i i, I get it right. you can do this with anything right. <laughs> i want to know what paul i mean you can go to the newspaper and reinterpret mm -hmm. the newspaper if mm -hmm. you want yeah what is paul doing and i like your idea of comparing him to other philosophers so maybe we could dive into some of these discoveries that you've made sure. of who sure. Paul is. Sure. Uh, another uh, special element in my profile is, uh, and everybody knows that, who knows my name, as it were, but there it is. Uh, I believe that um, one philosophy in particular in that period, namely so-called Stoicism, uh, is more relevant to understanding Paul than what we have usually uh, taken uh, to be the most relevant uh, type of philosophy, namely so-called Middle Platonism. Uh, here I should perhaps uh, explain a little bit. Um, we have Plato and Aristotle back in uh, the fourth century uh, BCE, and then uh, from around 300 uh, BCE, uh, we, ha we have Epicureanism and uh, Stoicism as the main uh, philosophers um, or philosophical schools. Um, there, there weren't that many uh, Christians who were interested in uh, Epicurus, uh, well, part, part, there, are, there are elements in Epicureanism that are relevant to, New, to, to the New Testament, but, but, um, but I would say that if you look at the um, overall picture in that period, it was Stoicism that uh, was the strongest kind of uh, philosophy. But eventually, and that is the interesting thing, in the first century CE and onwards, that is into the first century uh, CE, etc., uh, Platonism returned in what we call Middle Platonism. Eventually also Aristotle and Aristotelianism, which uh, is, is closely related to Platonism, uh, also uh, came into uh, the, the overall picture. Uh, but that is a bit later. So there is a period between 100 BCE and 100 CE where there is a battle going on between Stoicism on the one hand and uh, uh, and Middle Platonism uh, on the other. And that, that, I think, is where we should uh, uh, place, as it were, Paul and parts of the New Testament also. So for people like me who are completely ignorant of mm -hmm. philosophy, if mm -hmm. you might elucidate what is the difference or what is Platonism and what are the key differences? Because mm -hmm. you can probably get lost and, and pull mm -hmm. out a hundred mm -hmm. books mm -hmm. on Platonism mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. what are the key elements that make Platonism, Platonism, and Stoicism, Stoicism, and those differences, and why is Paul one and not yeah. the other? If you put it very, very um, 
basically, uh, and uh, it, it's it's a way of putting it that that will be immediately, I believe, contested. But I, I think there is actually still some truth to it. Uh, one should say that uh, Stoicism is uh, fundamentally uh, materialist and monist, and that means that the Stoics are in fact reacting against Plato, and Plato had. You may have heard about the ideas and the uh, uh, phenomenal world, etc. Is a kind of dualism uh, that um, the Stoics were reacting against. They insisted that everything in the world um, was some kind of material, uh, very, very refined, of course, in the case of God, even or things like that, uh, but still uh, material. Whereas uh, the the Platonists and and also the Middle Platonists, uh, they uh, absolutely uh, wanted to stress the, du the dualism, uh, that uh, the ideas were immaterial, uh, whereas uh, then, of course, the phenomenal world was, was material, uh, and, and that there was this um, sharp distinction uh, in the basic uh, metaphysics. Um, and that is what I'm playing on in that title you uh, mentioned on, on, on Paul, on the material spirit, that in understanding Paul, this is my contention, uh, we need to understand uh, the spirit, the pneuma, which plays a huge role in Paul, uh, in material terms. This is something we can come back to because it's that that is where I believe that this uh, idea of using uh, external philosophy to elucidate Paul actually helps a lot, that we can suddenly understand better what he is saying whenever he talks about the pneuma, if we take it to be, well, basically uh, a material entity that can interact with other material entities like our bodies. Um, I yeah. was reminded of 1 Corinthians 15, and I know we're sure. diving into Paul, but this resurrection scene is Absolutely. caused quite a debate, quite a stir among the community that I am involved in on, on YouTube, where yeah. there are the Orthodox Christian perspective, which mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, you know, believe, but um, that they say, well, there's continuity in Paul's concept of resurrection of the, of this new body that mm -hmm. is coming is mm -hmm. literally like what Luke and John are saying, where he's eating fish and he's physical and he's like physical body. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. when I try to talk to some scholars like Steve Mason and, and James mm -hmm. Tabor and others, mm -hmm. it's confusing because they'll say stuff like, well, Paul believes it's matter of some sort, but mm -hmm. it's not flesh and blood. It's not mm -hmm. physical mm -hmm. in the body mm -hmm. like what we're talking about. So mm -hmm. the Orthodox view within the creeds and all, they got mm -hmm. that wrong, but yeah. there's some truth to it being a physical spirit. Absolutely. Body. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, but but this is a very good point. Um, one of my key um, passages is precisely First Corinthians 15, where he talks about this resurrection body uh, and comes out saying that just as there is a psychic body, meaning evidently our body, as it were, uh, which is full of the psyche, the soul, uh, so there also is a body that is pneumatic. Um, a body that is pneumatic. So it is something that must be somehow uh, material. But uh, he also goes on to say that uh, flesh and, and blood cannot be uh, resurrected. So he does clearly operate with a different type of bodiliness for the uh, pneumatic body. And if you want to understand that, uh, then I believe that pr precisely stoicism is the best place to go because there uh, the pneuma plays a huge role and they go to some um, uh, to, to go, go some way to explain the material character of the pneuma, uh, which is in fact in their philosophy all over the world. That is, that is different from Paul. Uh, in, in Paul's case, the pneuma is something specific that God gives to Christ believers. It's not, it's not elsewhere in the world. So there is an important uh, difference between Stoicism and, and, and uh, Paul. But still, if you want to understand how the pneuma works in Paul, I think it's much better to have such an idea at the back of your mind than 
Well, I don't know how else you would, would actually uh, explain that passage. And if I can just make one additional point, uh, you are so right in mentioning Stephen Mason and James Tabor here, because one thing I have come to see, I hope, <laughs> at least to believe, uh, is that um, uh, in order to understand the, well, I start again, in spite of the fact that we have Philo of Alexandria, who was a Jew and a Platonist, in spite of that fact, uh, I believe that in order to understand what Paul is saying as a Jew, Stoicism is better because it's closer to, um, well, a traditional uh, way of thinking of uh, God and God, uh, divine intervention and things like that, namely as material uh, facts. This is so wonderful that you bring that up. I don't have the book, do I? Nope. There's a book by Francesca Stavrakopoulou called God in Anatomy. She just launched it and it's uh -huh. gone viral. And it's all oh. about God's <laughs> physical body. In fact, okay. she was perplexed as a young girl going through these temples and seeing there's God. There's an image of a God and there's a Greek God and there's mm -hmm. Athena and she mm -hmm. loved temples and gods. Anyway, the whole book's about God having a physical body. Mm -hmm. I also want to make a quick comment that I think is important to, to – make clear and, and to have your answer. Do you think the reason people get confused on Paul and put him in the middle Platonism or in some form of Platonism category is because one Philo, we love to look to contemporary mm -hmm. Jews mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Two, does Josephus fit into this category three where, um, or, you know, church fathers, they fall into the Platonism middle and Neo Platonism. And then also is there anywhere in the New Testament, because I see an evolution taking place, mm -hmm. where Platonism begins to be a model? And so people mm -hmm. are going backwards. Maybe it's in the gospel somewhere, mm -hmm. and they go, mm -hmm. Well, Paul mm -hmm. must have it because here it's in the mm -hmm. gospels, and mm -hmm. we're connecting dots that don't connect, if that makes sense. Right. Uh, yes, I think you're right that there are vestiges of Platonism in uh, the New Testament. For instance, in the letter to the Hebrews that you have already uh, discussed with Harry Attridge. Um, so so it's, it's just a matter, I can only repeat myself here, it's a matter of, of finding out what works best, as it were, in elucidating Paul. But can I just come back to what you said about seeing God in physical form, etc., etc.? That is not definitely what I'm saying about Paul, because I think that he distinguishes very clearly between the kind of physicality that we may operate with in connection with God, which is of, of a pneumatic character, uh, and then flesh and blood, uh, because he distinguishes so clearly and says that what, what will be resurrected is a, a pneumatic body, but flesh and blood cannot undergo this kind of resurrection. So it's definitely not a, a, a matter of, you know, seeing uh, God in so many, um, in so many uh, physical uh, forms. On the contrary, uh, I believe strongly that this is one place where Paul shows his Juda, uh, Jewishness, namely that he did not think of uh, God along um, the way that the Greeks or, or, or Romans, etc., did, where you did have all these different uh, gods and you made uh, statues of them, etc. There's a traditional uh, criticism of that in, in uh, Judaism. Um, and, and I believe he, it's not just a belief, but it's clear that he is very much against that, if you think of uh, Romans chapter uh, 4. But if I can just put in here uh, an interesting little point, um, if, we, if we think of um, uh, Stoicism again, in Stoicism you also find this kind of um, criticism of uh, the um, physical understanding of religion, if I may put it like that. For instance, in Zeno, uh, who founded Stoicism, there, there is a criticism of temples. In, in, in the uh, ideal city, there will be no temples at all, uh, because uh, th th that is not part, God is, as it were, within. So, so there is the same kind of idea on this particular point in Stoicism as in, in Paul the Jew. Wow. Um, so much. Yeah, I think that uh, Francesca Stavrakopoulou actually does think there's an evolution that takes place, especially mm -hmm. after Alexander the Great and Hellenism comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the ideas have evolved. Um, mm -hmm. You know, every conquering nation probably made an impact on the Jews. 
Uh, mm-hmm. So, so I imagine that's the case, of course, when Stoicism is reacting to Plato and mm-hmm. and all this. Mm-hmm. And I love that because mm-hmm. it makes it reminds me of Acts 17, whether historical or not. Sure. Uh, it looks almost like an Aristotle type of thing. Anyway, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm having fun it, it, because. Yeah. It's a it's a wonderful passage, absolutely, and it just shows that Luke understood so very much of uh, the whole context within uh, which early Christianity was developing. I love this. I'm 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 really interested in seeing Paul, trying to see Paul at least mm-hmm. with what he's trying to do. Mm-hmm. What mm-hmm. is he actually trying to say? What is he actually trying to do? And I think that uh, your di- your deep dive is going to help us understand Paul better. And this is my whole goal. It's, it's your goal too. Sure. Is there anything yeah. in the special profile that you didn't cover that you would like to? Um, well, let me see. I was thinking about that. So there's one thing I would uh, want to uh, take up because this is something that I have uh, come to see cle- more and more clearly. Um, if you were to ask me, have my views about Paul and Stoicism uh, developed uh, I would answer yes. Uh, they they have, um, particularly in in the following area. In my first book on Paul and the Stoics from the year two thousand, um, I explicitly set aside. I, I use that term "set aside." I was definitely aware of it, but I set it aside. The uh, the, the basic fact that Paul was an apocalypticist—that is, that he expected the world to be the whole world to be transformed very soon. Uh, this is something uh, that is clearly shown already in in his fir- earliest letter, First Thessalonians, and I believe that it is also uh, uh, clearly shown in his latest letter that I take to be Romans in chapter uh, 13. So he 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 expected that, and it's, it's enormously important that we uh, realize that and don't forget it in uh, our understanding. And that is where I have actually, I think, um, come to see uh, something better or more or whatever uh, um, in comparison with my early work, where I focused only on as it, what we might call the ethics. But the apocalyptic idea is belongs under what we might call the, uh, Paul's theology. Uh, and I have come to see that there is a very close connection, an intimate connection between his theology and his uh, ethics. I, I put it in these scare quotes and that's, that is ugly, but uh, th- that's because we have a clear sense of, I believe, uh, a distinction between theology on the one hand and, and ethics on the other, because there's been this kind of intellectual development in uh, European cultures. But in, in Paul, it's, it, it's, it's not so clear. He doesn't he, I think he immediately thinks ethics the moment he speaks about theology. And he also, which we may not like, uh, thinks that the proper ethics can only be had if you uh, have uh, the proper theology. Um, but but I think uh, what, what I had missed, as it were, was this intimate connection uh, between, uh, between theology and uh, ethics. Uh, and here, uh, if we have time for it, I, I would like to mention that um, in uh, the letter to the Philippians, he says in chapter 127, he's talking about what we would call ethics. I looked it up here. Live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Here, incidentally, what what, what I'm after here is worthy of the gospel of Christ, because that that ties the way they should uh, live, uh, that is ethically, uh, directly into the theology, the gospel of Christ. But here I would also uh, mention that um, the term he uses for live your life is polyteriste, and that means live in society. There is a distinct political element uh, to it. Live in society, polis, the polis is a city. Uh, live in society in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. And then he immediately in chapter two of Philippians uh, goes on explaining what, how they should live. And he first brings in something uh, about the, the, the pneuma, the spirit that he has and that they have. And he says two verses here, do nothing from selfish ambition, but in humility regard others as 
better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. I've written an article on this last verse because it's so important that he says, uh, let each of you look not to your own, own interests, but precisely to the interests of others. The translation I've given you here is from the New Revised Standard Version, and it's, it's, uh, it's okay. Uh, I just wonder what text they were looking uh, at, because there is a problem about uh, a small um, a small word there, Kai, but it, I have, what I wrote in this article is that it means, but precisely to the interests of others. So he is urging them to turn their backs on their own interests and only look at. And then he continues, let the same mind be in you, namely the one we just heard about, that was in Christ Jesus when he uh, came down from uh, heaven, et cetera, et cetera. There you see the closest imaginable uh, connection between something theological and uh, the ethics uh, directly uh, here and now. And this is something that I, I hadn't really uh, grasped sufficiently, I think, in my in my first book. But I, in fact, I, I make a lot of that in uh, Paul on Identity because I think it's so, so important. Yeah, you, you mentioned in your book, like, you you say I'm putting square sca uh, scare quotes, but mm -hmm. quotes, but I'm not going to continue doing it from here on. Right, and right, right, uh, right. and you're, you're you're definitely trying to say there's a connection here with his mm -hmm. apocalypticism mm -hmm. or his ethics mm -hmm. and theology. But you also talk about the apocalypticism as something important mm -hmm. in that particular phrase where it talks about care more for others than oneself. Is that a stoic yeah. idea? Oh, definitely yes. Uh, that that is precisely one of the basic ideas in Stoicism. That uh, as you grow up as a human being, uh, you come to realize that uh, what really matters is not what you can, as it were, get for yourself, but uh, that you act on behalf of all human beings for the very reason that they are like yourself, human beings. They have their minds, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and that calls for this um, open attitude to, towards others, forgetting uh, about oneself. So in that respect, I think there is a, a close con connection between uh, Stoicism and Paul. Do you think that Stoicism's impact on Paul may explain his universalism? And I say universalism not yeah. in like, not in a to total like post-mortem, mm -hmm. everybody's going to be saved in the end. Some mm -hmm. people argue Paul meant that Christ will be mm -hmm. all in all. Uh, mm -hmm. And maybe he does have that idea. Maybe. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, mm -hmm. as far as Paul's interested in going to the broader world of non-Jews, right, right. do you think his philosophy has made an impact on his mission? That is a very good question. Uh, I would be a little skeptical here for a number of reasons. One is that, <clears throat> I, as I said already, I think that he brings in philosophy only gradually. Uh, it, it's not so clear in the first le le his first letter, the first uh, first Thessalonians. There, I don't think you have some of the base, absolutely basic ideas in Paul about <clears throat> the Christ event and what it should mean. The pneuma, also the spirit, uh, enormously important. But the, he doesn't spell it out uh, uh, in 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 any great detail, and and he doesn't do it at all. I would say philosophically. Uh, so I think he had his uh, basic, uh, as it were, agenda uh, from the very beginning without, as it were, having elaborated in it in, in a philosophical manner. It's only later when, as I said, the problem of the law becomes uh, pressing to him that he wants to find ways of saying uh, both that uh, these uh, non-Jews in Galatia, they should not uh, become circumcised, they should not become Jews, they should not, in that sense, live under the law. But at the same time, also, that uh, once they have uh, uh, acquired Christ's faith and they have received the pneuma, they will, in fact, behave uh, well as as dictated by or by by, by the law they will fulfill uh, the law and, and that that requires some some explanation and that is where i think he uh, brings in uh, the philosophy so I, I i don't think that one can say that that his basic agenda which was of course to address 
non-Jews that it was dictated by his uh, philosophy. And, and I'm also a little bit skeptical, I must say, about, I've been working a, a, a bit on it, uh, about uh, universalism, etc. cetera. Um, in a way, there is a universalism in Paul too, uh, namely in the idea, as you're also hinting, that uh, uh, non-Jews might become Christ believers, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and eventually resurrected just as Jews uh, would or might uh, be. That is, of course, a, a sort of universalistic uh, idea, but but I think that it it comes out of something else, namely uh, the idea that uh, the Christ event is something uh, revolutionary that God has uh, set as has created. Uh, of relevance, it must be, since it is so revolutionary, of relevance to any, everybody, uh, etc. Plus the fact that that the essence of the Christ um, event and it, the way it functions on human beings is that they uh, they take it in, as it were, and it transforms them again via the pneuma. It transforms them so that any ethical problems there may have been. Uh, are resolved. And, and when, when you see the effect of the Christ event in that way, then you would immediately say, well, but then it must be relevant to everybody. But it's not because he has the idea of, you know, universalism somewhere and now we must go, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's, he comes from the Jewish background and he develops it from the inside. And that's, that's a better way of seeing it, I think. There's... I, I don't know if we'll ever have enough time to go into all of the wonderful things we could get out of these conversations because you no. reminded me of Christine Hayes. She did a, a recording about uh, what's so divine about divine law a lecture she mm -hmm. did. And mm -hmm. she's talking about how Jews, you know, have their law. And mm -hmm. in Philo, for example, he's trying to kind of compete in a way by mm -hmm. making the Torah, the mm -hmm. law of Moses, actually sure. equal equated with natural law or right, divine right, law. Right, 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 and yeah. so it makes me think of Paul in Romans 1 where he's like kind of doing what you're describing here where it's like mm -hmm. it's like okay so the letter of the law it'll kill like mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. but there's this it's written on their heart it's more of a numa law kind of thing. Yeah. Know? Yes, that's right. But but what is it that is written on the law, on, on, on their hearts? It is I believe the mosaic law. Uh, so, 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 so he he is not prepared to give that up at all. I don't think Philo either uh, meant to do that. But uh, right. as you as Jews, I think they 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 stick very strongly to to the Mosaic law. But then they precisely, as you say, and I think there is a sort of uh, parallelism between what you uh, said about Philo and what you find in Paul. They tr they try to to. Um, extend it uh, and, and the relevance of the law, of the law even to non-Jews. There's all sorts of great stuff. Um, so you you want to get into your own profile and reading of Paul developed or? Uh, well, uh, how it developed, I think I have, I have uh, actually um, made the most important point that, that he starts out in First Thessalonians um, uh, in a way that is not really philosophical in, in the way I define that, uh, but then under pressure uh, in connection with uh, these people in Galatians and the Mosaic Law, etc., uh, he becomes more and more uh, philosophical. There it shows, as it were, that he knew about these things and could uh, um, draw them in whenever there was a need for it. Um, and, and that is where I actually mentioned, it's not Mozart, I must say, but it's Beethoven. Uh, it's, it's, from, <laughs> from, it's, it's from the first symphony uh, until, until the ninth symphony. And I, I think um, if you think of the development from First Thessalonians until uh, Romans, uh, it, it is clear that uh, he had this kind of mind that uh, uh, developed and developed and developed and, and wanted to bring more and more material in and make it fit together, etc. And so you have uh, uh, Romans, which is of course a fantastic masterpiece in <laughs> in world literature, and and rightly calls for um, for continuous uh, investigation and thought. So 
as you described that you kind of put the apocalypticism to the side right. earlier right. and right. you've developed Paul within stoic thinking and diving deep. How, in what way did does apocalypticism play a role in this understanding of Paul as a stoic? Because if I may, mm -hmm. um, when I talk to scholars, they go, well, we have to remember first Paul's a Jew. Mm -hmm. And I get that. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about earlier in the beginning of this episode about how we shouldn't try to dichotomize Paul and go, mm -hmm. well, is he Jew mm -hmm. or is he Hellenized? Mm -hmm. He's mm -hmm. both. Mm -hmm. So if we have an apocalyptic Jew and he's stoic and he's mm -hmm. extremely Hellenized in some mm -hmm. sense, I'll just say mm -hmm. extremely, even though it's like, what does that even mean? Because right. at this point, everybody's Hellenized. They're all sweating Hellenism, you know, yeah. uh, it's coming out of their pores. But in what way did, the apocalypticism of Paul impact your understanding within Stoicism of Paul? Ah, uh, that is a good question because I think, well, uh, yeah, uh, I, I could, I was going to say that it didn't, <laughs> that, that uh, his apocalyptic stance uh, is part of his uh, Jewish heritage. And, and, and that is what, as it were, creates the whole frame of all his thinking. But uh, then I also want to connect uh, his apocalyptic stance uh, with uh, the phenomenon of the pneuma. Uh, of which we have spoken. It is a pneuma that is given to Christ believers and that lies behind the way they then live, you know, in the meantime, uh, between uh, now and the apocalyptic uh, end. Uh, and then also lies behind what happens at the ap uh, apocalyptic end. And this pneuma, as we also were talking about, uh, is, I think, one that one understands best in terms of Stoicism. So there is that kind of connection. But the apocalyptic uh, basic idea itself is not, I think, uh, relevant uh, to uh, Stoicism, apart from the fact, which is, of course, is interesting, that the Stoics, too, had an idea of a development of the whole world that would end up in the uh, big uh, fire when everything was, uh, as it were, um, drawn into God. And then there was a moment of silence uh, on, before God then began again to create uh, the world. That that kind of, of uh, image or, or picture is found in Stoicism too. But but it is it is very different from anything you'll find in in Paul. Uh, so I don't think that 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 is really that is one of the. I, I don't think you learn so much from for understanding Paul from bringing in uh, this uh, idea of the uh, eventual conflagration, as it is called, of, of, of the world. Uh, but you see that that is just wonderful with me that uh, I, I'm not after saying Paul was a stoic or anything like that, uh, but uh, trying to find material that helps us understand him best. I'm with you. I definitely want to figure that out as well. And uh, mm -hmm. this is why I do what I do and talk to scholars. Do you think that this panuma that Paul is discussing, how do I put this, the evidence that he will use to his audience, for example, in the Corinthians or in other people who are who are kind of doubting or questioning because some people come after Paul trying to say Paul's not giving you the whole truth and whatnot. Paul's frustrated. You could tell in some of his letters. That's why I know these aren't epistolary fictions. These look mm -hmm. so real. Sure, and sure, you mentioned sure. that in your book too, in the opening, you're like, these are, let's go ahead and get this off. There's a guy, mm -hmm. a human mm -hmm. here who's trying mm -hmm. to frustratedly it sometimes trying mm -hmm. to convey a message. Mm -hmm. But do you think the evidence of this panuma in speaking in tongues and stuff like that, I know this is a little bit off topic, but it's in the vein of all of this, uh, mm -hmm. is similar to like what sibling oracles and other Greeks were practicing things where, they believed that there were utterances and such that mm -hmm. were coming. What do you mm -hmm. think that practice is as it relates to Paul's non-Jewish audience? Because I just don't know how that would be a Jewish practice. It, it, it seems more of like, who's over here speaking in tongues and going into... Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's an interesting question, Derek. I haven't actually thought of that uh, as, as, uh, <laughs> as something to, to work on. Um, uh, in First Corinthians um, 14, um, 12 to 14, he does address this uh, issue of speaking in tongues. And 
And uh, evidently, uh, that is something that has been taking place in Corinth, uh, etc. Uh, he, of course, raises uh, a finger and, and says that uh, you, you had better, that there's a problem about that. If somebody comes in from the outside and hears that, what on earth will, will they <laughs> think? And so, so he, he speaks for news, which is, uh, well, reason, uh, r rationality, as it were, uh, intel intelligibility. Uh, and to that extent, against uh, the speaking in tongues. But Paul, of course, being Paul, he also managed to, manages to put in that he, of course, speaks in tongues better than, than anybody else. Uh, but whether that is something that has um, its roots in um, what we call Greek mysticism or not, I just don't know. Uh, nor do I know whether it is distinctly non-Jewish that that might be interesting, but um, I, I just don't know. Thank you so much. I, I'm sorry, I rabbit other. It just came no, to my mind, okay. that, yeah. and I appreciate your response. Um, you mentioned, and I believe as we're going into the profile of Paul, as you know, Paul's developed in your thinking. You mentioned Paula Fredrickson, and mm -hmm. I loved her book, Paul the mm -hmm. Pagan's Apostle. Right. So did I. And I think the reason is we're trying to like. Imagine a Jew who has mm -hmm. an apocalyptic framework, as we mm -hmm. discussed, mm -hmm. who's looking to the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Paul has a, a very, uh, how do I put this? Many Jews, rabbis, have imaginations with their text. Mm -hmm. And Paul has a big imagination that, mm -hmm. you know, the text seems to be alive even. Like he, you mm -hmm. know, the way he interprets, for example, 1 Corinthians 9, after he's trying to tell them like, hey, they can have wives and they can get money. I don't mm -hmm. want any of that, but mm -hmm. does God really care for oxen? You know, mm -hmm. for it is written and he's talking about don't mm -hmm. muzzle your oxen, et cetera. Mm -hmm. You know, he's, he's rewriting it to say that's mm -hmm. actually about us and me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what is, how does Paula Fredrickson's work? Like, where do you say, I agree, I agree, I agree, I like this. And then mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. do you split off in disagreement? Okay. Um, that also is a good question. Um, well, I think that uh, where I agree uh, is on the, the very basic point that um, Paul was a Jew and he remained a Jew all through. And this is enormously important. This is something that we have to get into our um, minds, as it were, and, and, and never forget. Because tradition has taught us that Paul was, well, a Christian, first of all, and then perhaps even the founder of Christianity or whatnot. Um, but 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 this this will not work. We have we have come to see that, uh, and and it is enormously important. There is a long scholarly uh, development here that has led to this, um, which we need not go into uh, here. But um, one could say that the position that Paula Fredrickson is representing is as it were, the, the, the newest um, uh, position within that uh, development towards stressing Paul's uh, Jewishness. Um, they call themselves Paul within Judaism. I think that is very unhelpful because the position that, that I'm going to delineate to, to you in, in a moment also sees Paul as uh, within Judaism. Uh, but... Um, uh, but, but there are some important uh, differences that I want uh, to insist on. So, so I think perhaps this is, this is a little too imperialistic to say that they alone, as it were, have uh, Paul within uh, Judaism. In Denmark, we actually speak of, of them as, or, or this uh, trend as the radical Paul, um, basing it, itself on, on, on something they, they themselves uh, said. Um, but that's just a parenthesis in a way. I'm going to argue here for a Paul within Judaism um, that also has um, some distinct um, characteristics about it. And this is where the disagree disagreement uh, comes in. It is true, and that is strongly uh, emphasized by the radical Paulinists, uh, that Paul addresses himself uh, only to non-Jews. Uh, his whole agenda is relevant only, well, is, is addressed to uh, non-Jews. 
But um, the question then is, is this only relevant, what he is saying to non-Jews, is that only relevant to non-Jews and not also to Jews? And this is perhaps where we um, part our ways, as it were, because I think that um, um, whatever he says about um, uh, the importance of the Christ event, the, the arrival of the Messiah, the reception of the Pneuma, etc., is also uh, relevant for Jews in the sense that they too should believe that uh, the Messiah has arrived in Jesus Christ and they too should receive uh, the pneuma. Um, Paula Fredrickson fortunately agrees that the, <laughs> that, that, uh, the pneuma is also relevant uh, to Jews. Uh, but, but if you do that, uh, then it seems to me that um, uh, we are very close to um, a kind of uh, agreement where Paul is articulating what I would call a new Judaism. Uh, it is Judaism. It is. It remains Jewish, etc. But it is a new uh, Judaism where the question of whether one is a Jew in the traditional ethnic, ethnic uh, sense becomes of less importance. Because there is one thing that ties Christ-believing non-Jews and Christ-believing Jews together, and that is what receiving the pneuma, acting it out in uh, uh, the communities here, here and now, and eventually uh, being saved at uh, uh, th through the resurrection. These central things are, I believe, uh, shared by Christ-believing uh, non-Jews and Christ-believing uh, Jews on Paul's view. Uh, that, I think, is what, what uh, chapters 9 to 11 of, of Romans is about, that uh, unfortunately uh, not all Jews have accepted this new message, but Paul is certain that uh, eventually they will. So He does have some pretty heavy language in Romans 9 at when he talks about the hardening of hearts that's come upon using yeah. that hardening yeah. of hearts on Jews and that exactly. some vessels are prepared for destruction. It's kind of a, sure. it's, it's sure. really harsh language. And of course he cries at the beginning of that chapter, like, well, I wish I could become a curse for my people and mm -hmm. then on and on. But I did want to mention in Romans, if we, if we could just one thing she said in her book that I'd love to mm -hmm. get your thoughts on. She says, Paul's writing this to non-Jews, a Gentile mm -hmm. audience. Mm -hmm. And that, Paul is trying to downplay the Torah. She thinks that Paul doesn't really think negatively of the Torah, but no. that Paul is downplaying it and making it sound bad for the Jewish or for the non-Jewish audience. So sure. kind of like she, she thinks that he's trying to psychologically like, get away from it. Don't follow it. But right. this gets into the heart of what you're describing here as a new form of within Judaism. Yeah. yeah. And, and that is, does Paul really think that for only non-Jews, but think it positive for Jews? Or does Paul really think toward hmm. the law? Right. What he's saying here? It's hard for me to know. Right. But but now you mentioned Romans. Um, um, Romans chapters 1 to 3 are central here because you're, you're right. I think it's, it's quite clear that he wants to downplay the importance of the uh, law for non-Jews. But in that passage, he, as I read it, uh, certainly also sh uh, says that there is a problem with fulfilling the law for Jews, too. Uh, otherwise, those three uh, chapters really uh, uh, don't uh, make any uh, sense. And, and, and that means that this is, as it were, the situation as it is now or was uh, before the arrival uh, of Christ. And uh, the arrival of Christ, the Christ event then, uh, was meant by God to bring that uh, impossible situation uh, to an end so that both non-Jews who had all these problems with, with uh, ethics, etc., and also Jews who also had some problems may now eventually uh, fulfill uh, the law and uh, be uh, be saved. Uh, so I think the the the, the whole way of set the setup in uh, Romans is, is of, of this kind. Uh, and and I, I really cannot make sense of Romans as a whole. 
uh, unless one passes that um, it is also, the Christ event is also thought by Paul to be relevant to uh, Jews. Um, but there are so many things with which I agree in, in Paul of Frederick. For instance, he speaks in chapter uh, 11 uh, of uh, God's Israel, uh, and people have traditionally uh, taken it that this meant just, you know, Christ believing uh, either non-Jews or Jews, uh, that is Christians. But I think that's wrong. Uh, uh, God's Israel is God's Jewish uh, Israel. Um, but, 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 but that doesn't uh, change the fact that he, he does want to say that there is a basic similarity between Christ-believing non-Jews and Christ-believing Jews, which is that through their uh, faith relationship uh, to God, their reception of the pneuma, etc., all these wonderful things that we've been talking about uh, will happen to them all. Uh, to. Uh, th 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 I cannot, simply cannot uh, uh, get away from that, however much. But I must say also, I learn, I, I usually say that I have learned most from Jewish scholars uh, throughout my career, um, and for good reasons, because they say something that we don't know, as it were, <laughs> uh, beforehand. So I, if I want to understand Paul better, then that is very helpful. Uh, and my um, conversations with Paul Fredrickson are enormously uh, helpful uh, to me. Yeah, I, I wonder if this Christ program, this is why I was saying a lot of the older models within critical scholarship of Paul, they think that Paul's actually going against the Torah, the letter of the mm -hmm. law, if you will. Oh, yeah. right? They, they yeah. go so far as to say he's doing something so new and different. Absolutely. He's against what the Jewishness, if you will, right, of right, the Torah, right. even Absolutely. though he says he's a Jew. Um the question I have is: is if he if he's demanding that Jews are also to play a part of this new this Panuma mm -hmm. program of Christ, mm -hmm. um, what does he think about them? So he's telling non-Jews, don't you don't need to do this. In fact, right. tell those people who are telling you to do this, Galatians, cut the right. whole thing off. So yeah. does is he expecting Jews to stop continuing in that letter of the law practice rather than just being good people, moral people. And I say that to say, because in acts, it sounds like, I think acts is a, an mm. apologist, a very smart author here who's That's harmonizing really, Paul. And they want to yeah. try and deal with this problem. I think mm. by mm. saying, Hey, Paul, we heard that you were telling Jews not to do this thing. Where did mm. that rumor mm. come from? Did Paul mm. actually tell Jews this? No. It's a, a, a serious very, question. It's a serious question, a very good question, and I also happen to believe that there is a very good answer to it. Uh, namely, that he's not saying to his fellow Jews that they should uh, stop practicing the law, uh, but he is saying something uh, different, namely that whether they uh, practice the Mosaic law as they are free to do, and th that's part of what it is to be a Jew in a traditional ethnic sense, or whether as a non-Jew you don't practice uh, the law in that sense is, and here it comes, indifferent. Uh, the Stoics said, ati aforon. It doesn't really matter for the one thing that really matters, which is uh, Christ face, pneuma, resurrection, etc. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's sort of at a, at a lower level uh, whether you do uh, one thing, that is, whether you are a Jew in the traditional sense, uh, or uh, whether you um, uh, whether you are not, there's something else that is the important uh, thing, uh, and and that that is that that means that Paul has not turned his back in any way to his traditional uh, Judaism. Um, uh, and his whole message is a Jewish one uh, too, but but it also means that uh, by distinguishing between what really matters, the only thing that matters, and all the rest, uh, he has opened up inadvertently. He didn't want to open up um, uh, for some people saying, okay, uh, we can forget about uh, the Jews, it doesn't really matter. We have uh, the, the only thing that really matters, namely the Christ event, etc. That is something that non-Jews 
who could say when they eventually they became uh, more and more, as we know they did after Paul, more and more uh, uh, Christ believers were non-Jews. So they could say, oh, wait, well, we, we don't want uh, this uh, Judaism, whatever. We have this the essential thing. So my picture is that Paul is placing himself on a razor's edge where he... Uh, belongs on the one side with the Jews, but other people might understand him later on uh, as turning his back to uh, Judaism. I, th I think that that image helps us to understand the actual uh, historical development, namely that uh, eventually uh, uh, Christ Christians, as we may then call them, turn their backs on uh, on Judaism. Paul didn't want that. And in fact, I think that in Romans 9 to 11, he had, as it were, already foreseen the risk that this might happen, which is why he so much insists that uh, Christ belief, etc., etc., it's a Jewish matter. The roots are Jewish, uh, and they must never forget that. Uh, for, forget that. He also says that, remember that uh, when G God cut off some branches from the olive tree, uh, tree um, and put others in, namely the non-Jews, he, he may also go on to, to cut them off if they don't uh, understand the, the situation correctly. So he is really threatening, threatening uh, his non-Jewish uh, addressees in, in, in Romans. I can see how replacement theology would have mm -hmm. reinterpreted Paul out the gate because two yeah. factors I see that are coming in here, exactly mm -hmm. what you're describing about the... The, look, I've got to keep a program for these Jews as mm -hmm. a thing because, well, has God, he says over and over in Romans, like, has God mm -hmm. forgotten his promises? Yeah, yeah, God yeah. forbid, like he hasn't. Yeah. So, but mm -hmm. then what really gets me interested is this apocalypticism. So mm -hmm. if the program is supposed to happen soon mm -hmm. and it doesn't happen, well, mm -hmm. we're left to our own devices. Exactly. We, we have to figure exactly. out a way that the program keeps going. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. instead kind of cognitive dissonance in yeah. a way, kind of resets, oh, what Paul meant is this new kingdom that's here, and yeah, and it's... Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, you got it. And that is one point where uh, it's so important to remember the apocalyptic character of, of Paul. He was only thinking for the next few weeks, as far as he knew. Uh, and, and and that makes enormously uh, an enormous difference uh, in his... Uh, in, in 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 the whole situation in which he is uh, thinking uh, so but you put it very well yourself i love this and i almost want to i wanted to get on paul and it, this book i hope everybody gets it by the way paul on identity <laughs> i really it's fun i'm not i'm not just saying that like i your writing style is very good and for those who've not like read their bible uh, mm -hmm. like deeply they just mm -hmm. read scholarship you're going to mm. get Paul and the scholarship in this because he quotes mm -hmm. Paul. And mm. sometimes you do tweaks of your own, like you take the NRSV, but then you do a little tweak of your own little mm -hmm. interpretation. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I love the way that you have written this style so that we can get a better understanding of Paul, but then mm. hear it in layman's terms to understand, okay, right. we're, right. Go we're going right. deep. And yeah. so I would love to fo follow Paul and how his identity goes into the Gospels but then yeah. they change his identity over time in a weird way. Mm, like they start mm, to, mm, so Paul mm. is like a very important person in Mark or earliest gospel. But then I don't know if you have something to say on that. That would be wonderful to hear. Your oh, uh, yes. In, in fact, I have, because I've been working on both the gospel of Mark and uh, John then in the book, you uh, mentioned John and philosophy. Um, uh, primarily in the first place, as those texts themselves, that, that is really what we must do. We, we cannot bring everything in. At, at first, we must uh, form an opinion on how does it hang together as a, as a whole, this particular uh, writing. But then I have also um, thought uh, and asked myself uh, when, as, as part in a way of that um, piece of interpretation, uh, is there, is there, Ah, yes, here, yeah, yeah. It looks as if they have uh, actually read Paul and they have transformed it uh, in this and that way. And, and I, th I think that, uh, it, it, again, it's not um, 
so uh, f fantastically important to say whether they actually had read Paul and transformed it, etc. But but I I do think that one understands perhaps again better both what Mark is doing in uh, chapter eight and what uh, what um, uh, John is doing in in chapter fifteen, etc. etc. If one take it, yeah, well, they may actually have been reading Paul and they have understood uh, his basic message in, but then transformed it. Uh, in 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 their own context, because the, of course their, their context is entirely different. They are talking about Jesus, uh, and and Paul, of course, is not talking about Jesus, but about what it means to the congregation once Jesus has died and has risen, etc., uh, etc., et and they are living in this uh, short interim period. I'd like to ask a few more questions as we wrap mm -hmm. up this wonderful episode. Mm -hmm. Paul says in First Corinthians fifteen, he died. He was buried, and mm -hmm. then he rose again, or if you will, a, a probable better term in the Greek would be the apotheosis concept. He, he's taken mm -hmm. up, he ascends. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. In what way does Stoicism play a part in that? And then do you see Mark creating the narrative of this empty tomb and the women at the tomb? Is this more, in your opinion, more of a fiction of uh, – creating more narration about this of what Paul says just very briefly in first Corinthians 15. How do you see that connection? If you uh, the first uh, answer is that I think that uh, Stoicism is only relevant uh, in connection with first Corinthians 15 to the, uh, bep, 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 to the uh, understanding of the resurrection body that we talked about, the, the, the Soma Pneumaticon. Um, apart from that, I, I, I'm not really. I don't think that uh, Stoicism is is particularly helpful in understanding anything in First Corinthians uh, 15. Um, then on to uh, Mark 16. I think it is extremely important to understand that Mark very clearly says that what he has been describing is Jesus of Nazareth. That is uh, the 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 human G Jesus. Uh, and uh, what comes after that? Uh, everybody knows what uh, comes after that, and and um, Mark definitely knows it because he has already described it, sort of prefigured it uh, uh, in uh, chapters uh, nine, uh, where Jesus is seen on the mountain with um, with uh, Moses and Isaiah. Uh, so so he, so. And, and so Mark is quite clear that Jesus is not just Jesus, the human being, uh, but in fact, the resurrected uh, Christ. But he doesn't want to bring that uh, out. And that is why we have just the empty tomb uh, and and uh, the angel uh, saying that uh, he, is, he is elsewhere. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth. That is a human. He is not here. Um, uh, that is a clear... Um, um, clear emphasis uh, f from by Mark that that this is what his um, written uh, theme was Jesus of Nazareth. Then we have to, in a way, uh, provide all the the rest of the story that that one could, of course, uh, read in 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 Paul, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but 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 that that is not his. Uh, uh, his his agenda and and it, it it I think it's very very important that this is the earliest gospel and he wanted and he probably created the gospel he wanted it to have that specific character uh, that uh, the 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 divine uh, resurrected uh, Christ like uh, character of uh, Jesus was certainly known to the reader but was not spelled out in in any way. Uh, and this is very different then from what uh, John does, because there he Jesus walks around constantly saying all these things about himself. I, I and the <laughs> Father are one, etc. Nobody understands it. Uh, I, I personally believe that the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of John are very closely uh, connected. Uh, John had read Mark and, and then done uh, interesting things to it. But there is this uh, sheer, uh, clear uh, difference between um, between Mark's idea and uh, uh, John's idea, uh, I don't think you can tie any of that, any of that specifically to uh, Paul. 
um, where, where you find um, similarities between both John and uh, Paul and Mark and Paul is in, in what we could call the anthropology and ethics, where, where it uh, is all about what believing in that Christ figure means to the human being also ethically. There, you, in those passages have referred to uh, Mark 8 and, and John 15, you can, you, you can see some interesting uh, similarities. This, what, that's why I brought up uh, the scholar you brought up in your book, um, William mm -hmm. Reed, as he talks mm -hmm. about this prefiguring. Shh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I love that about this. <laughs> you know exactly what I'm talking about. I love it. Um, I love that. And I wanted to bring up Paul just to get what you thought Paul meant in what's going on here. Do you think Paul meant Jesus was like, obviously he says he was crucified. He's mm -hmm. obviously buried. We, we go to the Gospels quickly in our minds because Paul doesn't give us anything there. And it's like, what does he mean? Buried in a tomb? Does he give it? Uh, right, right, right. But First um, Corinthians 15 is, as you said, about uh, the resurrection of Christ in the first half of the uh, chapter. And they, this is something people have seen him, et cetera, et cetera. And if, if you don't believe that, you don't believe in anything in, in, in this whole area. But that's only the first part. Then the second part, of course, is, but but how... Can we imagine uh, a human being being resurrected? That's something that the, the Corinthians have been asking about. Uh, and then he goes into all this uh, material ending up with a, a pneumatic uh, body. We could put two and two together here and say, well, if we ask how Jesus was resurrected, uh, the obvious answer is that he was resurrected in the same way uh, by the pneuma that, as it were, was operating on his uh, physical body and transformed it. Transformation is enormously important here. Transformed it into a pneumatic body. And as such, he is now present in heaven with uh, God, etc., etc. It but would Paul, be fair to say there was a missing body then, right? If, if That's why you would say yeah. Mark is con con kind of, there's continuity in Mark saying, his body's no more. It's not here. Yeah. It's transformed. That's right. That's right. The only thing is that we are now into the area of speculation. <laughs> <laughs> I love uh, because, it. <laughs> because uh, uh, Paul does not in 1 Corinthians 15 himself um, makes the step from what we might want to say about the resurrection of human beings in general and what happened to Jesus. He doesn't do that. So uh, if we do it, uh, we are on slippery uh, gr ground. And if we then take this um, additional, uh, draw this additional conclusion that this fits in with the empty uh, tomb, uh, then, okay, uh, you could say that, but it's not in Mark either. So we, we, must, we must really try not to um, put ideas into the text we are uh, reading in order to make the whole thing uh, cohere. Uh, we have to, at, at certain points, we have to say, we just don't know. We are not told. And if we are not told and we cannot form a decent uh, guess about it, we had better say that we don't know. Right. And this, I'm about to ask you the final hot question. <laughs> and, and, and it's kind of something I pieced together in an article I wrote where I said, I called it the minimal doubts argument. And mm -hmm. it's because there's, there are apologists out there that call the minimal facts argument. They want to like try mm -hmm. and tell mm -hmm. everyone why they're damned if they don't believe mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, so I combat some of this stuff and I write mm -hmm. articles. And I think that it, at best people have faith for a reason. They, they, mm. they, it's faith. It's not fact. It's not here is absolute proof. It's it's a belief system. Mm. But um, I think that and, and tell me where you stand on this. I'm just going to paint my picture and then you tell me what your picture looks like. Mm -hmm. I think there was a split. I think that Paul had a split from the Jerusalem church. I think Acts is trying to harmonize them and bring them together. Mm -hmm. But really, mm -hmm. there was a break off. I don't mm -hmm. think Paul and the other guys. So eye to eye, I may disagree with Paula Fredrickson in Galatians. I mm -hmm. think that when he's giving the example of I stood and told Peter to his face, mm -hmm. I think this is evidence of real problems that Paul and the Jerusalem church had. Mm -hmm. And that I think James is sending spies to spy out Paul. I am I'm convinced that this makes more sense, even though we can't be dogmatic and we can't say, oh, I'm certain. I think that this makes the most sense. Then when I read Mark, 
I called them the dim-witted disciples. They they never mm. get it. They, they, they just <laughs> sure. and we're talking about the Jerusalem disciples. Mm. These are the mm-hmm. it's constantly dogging the twelve. They never mm. get it, and it's kind of uh, smashing them a little bit. Mm-hmm. That's why I see Matthew makes them good looking. Mm-hmm. Mark downplays mm-hmm. them, and mm-hmm. at the end, the twelve are supposedly the direct followers of Jesus. Mm-hmm. They don't get it, and mm-hmm. then it says. The, the, the man in the tomb and the linen says, go um, tell the others that to meet in Galilee, like we said, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. the women went and told no one for they were afraid. <laughs> so the way I see it is this is a way of saying, in my opinion, and it's guessing that Paul is constantly having to say that I am the greatest apostle. In fact, more than the others. And at the end of that list in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, Mm. listen, I know I'm the least and I'm the last, but I work harder Mm. than all of them. And it seems like yeah, (laughs) there's always a problem going on between these guys. So when I read Mark, and maybe it's my intuition and little clues that make me take this conclusion, I think that Mark is saying they didn't get the message right. They didn't Mm. get the full revelation. Paul probably did. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm guessing. But 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 here I think we have to say the following. Um, you are trying to uh, sort of uh, reconstruct a historical situation behind the text. Right. Uh, but, but one could say that uh, the text makes sense. This not understanding, misunderstanding of the disciples uh, makes sense on its own. Uh, And that is, and and if it does make sense on its own, uh, then there's no um, text intrinsic urge to move uh, outside the text and to make this uh, historical reconstruction. And in that case, I think, okay, then we had better stay with the text internal uh, meaning. Uh, now, I'm I'm presupposing here that there is a text internal uh, meaning, which is that that uh, it is in fact, uh, well, difficult to understand about uh, Jesus, uh, all the things that Mark also claims about him, but even, but only uh, indirectly in those passages I've referred to. Uh, it is a difficult uh, thing to, to have that kind of uh, Christ face uh, with the precise content that uh, Jesus born, as Paul says, at, at a specific time, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, was also the Messiah in the sense that the whole um, phys- physical machinery of the pneuma, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and God's intervention with him, etc., that that all of that uh, took place. That 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 is not so easy to understand, and that is something then that uh, Mark, in a way, wants to to celebrate, so that you have the kind of opposition between what is what is so difficult to understand that they don't get it, etc. At the same time, of course, as Mark also has it, that the demons who belong at that level, they they know who he is. Right. So you have you, you have this kind of uh, uh, tension between what human beings can understand and not. It seems to me to make uh, excellent sense and to make good enough sense not to um move 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 outside the text right. and try to yeah. I think the only thing I have going for me is that Mark is very Pauline and because it's very Pauline that's about the best I have going for me I'm just <laughs> guessing but but you're right I, I I'm that's why I said I'm not dogmatic I think there could be something to this whole I'm thing. all against guesswork in biblical studies I I think that that is that is the reason why one can, as it were, constantly produce one one theory and one theory and one theory. Um, much of that is guesswork, and I, I abhor it. <laughs> of course, people can say that what I'm trying to do is guesswork too, but um, I, I do believe and I do hope that, and these will be my final words, that uh, my suggestions for reading Paul can be, as it were, um uh, validated by a shared sitting down and reading the text and talking about what uh, it uh, aims to say um and that is, that is where i also 
disagree with Dale Martin with whom we, right. uh, we, we began that there is such a thing as solid his historical uh, work on these texts. And, and for that, for the same reason, I, I, I'm, I really don't want to enter into speculation. It's better to say that we just don't know. Uh, of course, we human beings are put together in such a way that we would like to have the answers. But it, but, but it is science and I think scholarship to say that uh, even if we want to have the answers it, when we cannot, we shouldn't try to postulate something. What do, in that final thing is part of this is do you think there was a split or a problem at least between Paul and the other apostles when he talks about super apostles when he starts or do you think oh, it could be anybody I mean we, we, we don't know that there right. is super apostles in first Corinthians were directly connected with or, or with Peter or anybody else again we cannot know um, so so I, I, I don't want to, to speculate about uh, that at all uh, I think I can make excellent uh, sense of Second Corinthians in, in those passages without knowing precisely who they were or right. without knowing precisely what kind of other things they, uh, you know, um, focused on in their understanding of the, of the Christ event. It, it's, it's so much a matter of trying to speculate behind, et cetera, et cetera. And if we cannot, et cetera, et cetera, I made my point. So yes, yes, you know yes. That. Well, <laughs> <It's boring>. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Trolls, Enberg, Peterson, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I hope everybody goes and gets your books. You've got right here on Amazon, Cosmology and Self and the Apostle Paul, the one we talked about today, Paul on Identity. I'm sure there's more that could be said. From Stoicism mm. to Platonism, John and Philosophy and Aristotle's Theory of Moral Insight. These are the books on Amazon. It looks like not all of your books are on Amazon. Well, they should be. Uh, the one called Paul and, and the Stoics from 2000, I don't know whether it's available, but uh, never mind about that. I'm sure it can, <laughs> it can be got somewhere. Get the books, check out the material, join Myth Vision's Patreon, help support us here. I hope you've enjoyed the episode and let us know if you'd want to see another one in the future where we can take another dive into the material that Trolls goes into. I'm excited. I enjoyed how clear you are. You elucidate very clearly what you mean and what you're trying to say. I've learned a lot in this episode. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Yes, sir. And never forget, ladies and gentlemen, we are with <laughs> <Myth> vision <laughs> it's good to be young <laughs> join myth vision's patreon today to access hundreds of videos that i have worked hard in high quality content that are not in public domain they're only on the patreon you will also have direct access to me referring academics questions ideas or just want a private chat you have that access with me also, I'm trying to do more traveling to educate people from more academics and expand what kind of material I do produce on MythVision. This is a full-time gig and you're helping the community by joining. I'm trying to put together more to educate people who have harmful cultic practices or ways in which they're harming society. We are educating them from MythVision on better understanding these ancient texts and mythologies and history in a way like not many shows do. So please, I could use your help and you're gonna get and benefit a lot by joining as a member.